This is the Milo Beasley Show. This is the Milo Beasley Show. There's only one thing you need to know. This is the Milo Beasley Show. And now, here's your host, Milo Beasley. And welcome to the Milo Beasley Show, dude, 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 episode number 341. Oh man, is it? I don't know how we got there already. Uh, I'm super excited for our next guest. Uh, for for folks who have been watching uh, The Young Rock, you definitely know this face. So please help me welcome at this time, Wayne, the maniac. Matty, how are you doing, man? Good morning. How are we? Good, good. Yeah, bo- it's morning for you, evening for me. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, I, I just have a question about this Australian time you know that I, I get time differences but what's up with this 30 minute increment over there yeah it's a bit different they like to break it up in between the states just to confuse us i think that's probably <laughs> why <laughs> uh but i guess you probably get used to it right yeah and we have a thing called daylight saving too so when it comes into summer the times change again and some of the states fall in line together and then by the end of daylight saving it all just goes to crap again <laughs> well uh again thank you for for coming on and chatting with me man we have a, a lot to talk about you've had you've had a, a heck of a, a life so far and you're only like halfway through it so uh you know it's uh you've done the professional wrestling thing you've been uh, a, a bodyguard you've done bodybuilding and now you're acting um yeah like uh so let's let's dive into it first so what came first? Was it bodybuilding? Was it wrestling? Was it doing, uh, you know, uh, security stuff? Which one of those came first that led the, the building blocks? Um, I think it was probably joining the gym when I was about 16, which is what really started it. Uh, and I started training. I was bullied as a kid in school. So when I got a bit older, I felt like I wanted to really build myself up. Uh, to be able to protect myself. But at the same time, too, I'd fallen in love with professional wrestling when I was five. So all I wanted to do was look like Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior. So it made sense to move and, and, and join the gym straight away as soon as I could. So I started doing that. And then when I was about 19 or 20, I actually got asked to compete in my first bodybuilding contest. Um, and subsequently, I won Junior Mr. South Australia. And then got the bug for bodybuilding. So I competed six months later and won the title again. Um, and then I was prepping for my third contest and I actually injured myself, but I managed to still compete, which was okay. And then my fourth contest, I really had a serious injury. So I had to pull out and take some time off, but I was never going to stop training. So I continued in the gym. It also helped because I started doing security work, basic security work back then, like in nightclubs and hotels, pubs, bouncing is what we sort of refer to here. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I kept training because of that sort of work as well. And to cut a really long story short down really quick, I did security at a wrestling show. Uh, and at the end of the show, the promoter come up to me because he was upset. And I said, what's wrong? He said, you made everyone look at you and not look at the ring. And I said, but I didn't do anything. I just stood here. I mean, I'm, I'm six foot three. I was about 142 kilos back then. Uh, and he said, everyone thought you were part of the show. And I said, well, yeah, okay, I get that. Long story short, eight months later of training, bang, I'm in the ring. And that's how I started wrestling. That's, that's crazy. So they, mm. so yeah, you, so you were doing uh, just security and <clears> he <throat> said, you need, you need to be there. Pretty much. Yeah. They said, you, you've got the look. And I mean, you know, that reference is around a lot. People have the it factor for wrestling. You have the look or whatnot right. and. Back then, my hair was kind of short like this, and it was bleach blonde. Uh, and I think I had half, like a little half chin goatee. I had no tattoos back then, but I was just big. And I think that's what uh, everyone, especially being in Australia here too, they would expect wrestlers to look that way. Whereas the show I was on, a lot of the lads were young or they were small and so on. And then there's this big monster just hovering over in the corner doing right. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned when you were when you were young you know, you fell in love with wrestling. Who were some of those guys that made you fall in love? Who were some of your favorites? And and who were the guys that you hated? Uh, look, Sergeant Slaughter obviously had to be one of my favorites, of course. Um, 
then you'd have the Macho Man, Hulk Hogan. Uh, but I was a real big fan of uh, two really different ones. One was The Missing Link because he was just nuts. And then, of course, then you got to throw in George the Animal Steel as well. And I have, a, I have a funny story about George. They toured Australia back in the <clears throat> mid-'80s, late-'80s, I think it was. And uh, my mum managed to get me and my dad tickets to the show. And we are on the front row. Uh, and, again, to break it down really short, George went berserk in his match, grabbed the chairs and the barrier, threw them all in the ring, and then all of a sudden he grabbed me. I'm about 13, and he pulls me into the ring and makes me tear up the turnbuckle like he used to. So right. I was just, I couldn't believe it. It was nuts. Oh, man. And, uh, and it's not like today, if you, if that happened today, you'd have, you know, video footage of it. Everyone would have their cell phones out. Um, I mean, but you, you still have that memory and nothing can beat memories, right? Yeah. Look, I actually have a, a, a few photos that my dad managed to snap on one of the old school cameras that they had back then. I think they're on my Instagram. They're broken up a bit. You, you have to look, but you can see it's me. I've got on a, uh, a black jumper with a, a the WrestleMania 2 T-shirt over the top. I had my Sergeant Slaughter camouflage pants on. So, you know, it was really cool to be able to still have those photos. I actually sent them to George's family uh, prior to him passing away and got to chat to him briefly. And he, he, he still remembered it, which was great. So That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, to, to always have that memory and... Uh, to, to, for that to be a catalyst years later when you actually got in the business. Did you, did, did that make you remember that when you were in the ring that the people on the outside were making those memories as well? Yeah, it did a bit. I mean, I remembered when I was in the ring with George, just looking around at the crowd and thinking, oh, my God, all these people are looking at me. And obviously, <laughs> I wasn't a wrestler then. I was just this little kid. But then fast forward to many years to when I'm wrestling in there, and especially when I was playing the heel, I was interacting with everyone, making everyone yell at me, scream at me, throw something at me. And it, I remembered back to when I was a kid thinking, wow, can you imagine if I did this for real? And then sure enough, it happened. It was amazing. Do you have do you have a preference on baby face or heel work? Uh, do I like doing the heel work? Do you, do you have a preference of baby face or heel? Oh, um, no, well, see, it was hard for me because when I started, when I came in, I came in as a face. What had happened was uh, the night that my debut was, I was still doing security at the show. And we had a famous TV presenter in the ring interviewing the, uh, the the heels that had gone over on the night. And then, of course, the heels turn and beat up the TV announcer in the ring. And what I do is I tear off my security shirt and go running in and save the day. So that's how, how I came into the business that way. But then so everyone was cheering. I was the good guy. And that went on for ages. And we tried a couple of times to turn me heel um, and I would, you know, smack the ref, pull out a chair, do whatever you could, yell at someone. Right. But it wouldn't work. People kept cheering for me. <laughs> Even when I popped the ref, they loved it. So I'm thinking, what, what do I have to do to make these people hate me? Um, and then it was a few years later, I started to get a few tattoos and I took some time off because I had an injury. So when I come back, I looked a whole lot meaner. Um, and then I did the heel stuff again and then they started to get it. So it was really right. good. I got over as a heel, which was cool. That, that, that's awesome. Now I want to talk about uh, young rock a little bit. Um, how did, how did that happen? Did you send in a tape? Did they seek you out? Did, um, you know, did your uh, agent send out some information? How did, how did that happen? Because again, it's not like you're in Hollywood, you're not even in the country. So how did, how does that happen? Yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting story. I saw that a casting agent was advertising for professional wrestlers uh, in another state. So I said to my casting agent, Ann Peters, lovely lady, I said to Ann, I said, Ann, you know I'm a wrestler. I need to have this role. This is me. She goes, yes, yes. Don't worry. I'll, I'll get onto it. So she did, and I, I got my first audition for it, and I had to audition for Brutus Beefcake. I thought, okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And when I do auditions, I, I like to go all out. So I bought the pink forearm sleeves. I had a little bow tie. I put on a vest with no shirt on. And I had a big pair of the sicker tears that he'd bring to the ring just to really get in the character for it. And it was only, it was only like one word, uh, not one word, sorry. It was one line. 
Right. I think it was I'm going to do the strut up and down your spine, like Beefcake used to say when he was doing his, you know, thing. So I did that, and we sent it in, and we didn't hear anything back for a little bit. So I rang Ann again. I said, Ann, you got to help me out here. What's going on? She goes, all right, hold on. So she gets in touch with them again, and they come back, and they get this. She goes, I've got another one for you. It's great. Let me let me have it. So she gives it to me, and it's King Kong Bundy. And I'm like, <laughs> wow. How's what that going to work? I'm thinking, you know, I'm really hoping they have a fat suit because I'm not essentially built like Bundy. I can, I can have the bald head. That's no problem. But the body, right. I was like, mm, don't know. Anyway, did that one. That was just a one line or two. It was something like, give me a five count, like Bundy used to say when he'd go for the pin. Um, so that didn't come out. I didn't get anything from that either. And then I said to her, I said, Anne, I said, I need to be in this show because now I found out what it is and I found out it's about the rock growing up as a kid. And I'm like, oh my God, I need to be in this show. So she comes back to me and <coughs> excuse me. She goes, we got one more. So okay, great. She goes, Sergeant Slaughter. I've gone, yes. All right. Beautiful. So keep in mind back then when I was to do the audition, I had an enormous black beard. I looked like a pirate. Um, so with my hair and stuff, it was, it was really, really dark. So I went to the military store and I bought a camouflage jacket. I bought a, a camouflage hat. I bought the aviator sunglasses. I bought the, the whistle that was on the lanyard that he had, everything. So when I've gone to do my audition, I've dressed myself all up. I've got the sunnies on, got the hat, and then I've got this big, massive black beard. So, I mean, you can only see this much of me right. here. And even then there's sunglasses there. <laughs> You really can't see anything of me at all. Uh, and Sarge had a few lines, which was great. It was a bigger role. So I've um, read it, and it's the scene where I was in the grandmother's uh, apartment when we were right. doing the, the meeting. So I have to say that, you know, much a man's not there and so on, and then I have to hold up that bit of paper that says I'm taking notes for him. So they said to me, they said, they want you to have fun with it, ad lib with it, you know, don't be too serious and so on. All right. So I put on my Sergeant Slaughter's voice, delivered the lines. Uh, and then when I said, I'm taking notes, I've turned the pad around. What I've done is I've drawn the American flag, drawn the eagle. But then down the bottom here, I've drawn a wrestling ring with stick figures in there. And it was Macho Man coming off the top rope doing the elbow. <coughs> Excuse me. So I've put Macho Man's voice on it and stirred him up. And they loved it. They thought it was great. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, it was. Um, sorry, I got something in my throat. <laughs> <coughs> that's better. So, yeah, I did that and I sent that off. And they really liked it. And they said, look, we want, we want to see if you can do one more a little differently. So, um, what did I do? I did the same lines, of course, but this time I've gone and stirred up Roddy Piper about something about being, a, you know, if you want to dress like a woman, you can go see Roddy Piper. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So we sent them off anyway. They, they were all happy with it. And it took like 83 days before I heard anything back. And um, they said to me, they said, look, they really, really like you, but there's one problem. I said, what's that? They said, they need to see your jawline and your chin. Right. Obviously, that meant I had to shave off my beard. Now, I hadn't shaved my beard or my body off in 30 years. So I'm like, oh, my God, this is this is huge. And I said to them, I said, well, do I have the role or not? And they said, well, no. Yeah. They need to be able to see your jawline. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyway, we've, we've gone ahead. I've said to my wife, what do I do? She said, don't be stupid. Shave off. <laughs> I've got the clippers and I'm shaving it off and I'm looking into the sink as I'm shaving it off and I'm almost crying and oh my god oh my god <laughs> so it all comes off and I do the moustache like Sarge put the hat back on put the sunnies back on and I had to take a photo and send it to him so I've taken a photo sent it to my agent and they've sent it off to production I didn't know at this stage that production included the rock you know he had to have the final say right so we sent the photo off and it was less than 24 hours. I get the call up straight away. They go, they love you. You've got it. So it was pretty amazing. It, it sort of happened instantly after that. That That's great. Now, when you got the role, did you 
did you think it would be a one-time thing? Did you, did they tell you it would be multiple episodes? Um, it was essentially the first one in season one. I only had one episode. I had episode six. Right. And that was the one when we had the big battle royal. Um, but we had that meeting in the grandmother's uh, apartment first. So we had that scene. We did the dream sequence when we were talking about what's happening. We were seeing what was going on. So we filmed that as well. And then, of course, we had the big battle royal at the end of the show. So I knew it was only one episode, but it was, for me, I didn't care. You know, it was a bigger role than what I'd auditioned for originally. So I was pretty much seen through most of the episode, which was great. Um, but then to get the call up to say, you're wanted back for season two. Um, and I got three episodes out of it with more dialogue, more action. I was over the moon. So, you know, it made me feel like I did well in what I'd done to portray Sarge, as well as getting kudos from Sergeant Slaughter himself to say how proud he was that I'd, uh, you know, shown such a great uh, version of him, let's say. Right, yeah. Uh, does, I mean, and the, the irony of you uh, playing one of the biggest American wrestling icons of, of all time. I mean, that's it's not lost on me. Yeah. You know, you know what? An Australian playing such an iconic American, it doesn't right. compute, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, how, how hard is it to to I, I'm sure you've heard Americans trying to do Australian accents and they're not good. They're never good. So how hard is it to do an American accent? Oh, for me, that that's easy because I'd wrestled for 15 years. So my idea of a professional wrestler is a big American. That's what a, a wrestler is. Even when I wrestled here in Australia, what I would do is I'd put the American accent on because then the kids would love it even more. They really, really believed that you were this big, amazing American wrestler because, you know, I'd, I'd watch it when the other guys would come out and they'd shake hands and they'd talk to fans and they'd go up to them and go, oh, get I made, how are you? Yeah, I'll sign an autograph for you and all that. And I'm like, it's just, the stigma's all gone. So I used to put that, a really strong American accent on and they all believed it straight away. And my accent pretty much is good enough that the, the linguist lady who was on set who would sit off camera and listen to us all, especially most of the Australians that were in the show, to make sure we were pronouncing the words correctly in the American accent. She met me in a makeup trailer before, and she sits down and uh, she goes, Wayne, and I go, yeah. She goes, I just need to have a chat to you about a few things and so on. So I'm doing this all in my accent straight away. And uh, she looks at me and she looks at the paperwork and she goes, you're from Australia? I'm like, yeah. She goes, hmm. She says, your accent's very good. I said, thank you. She goes, oh, I don't need this. And she got up, she walked out, left me alone for the rest of the show. It was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you mentioned the makeup chair, and that's, I, I have to talk to you about that because clearly Sergeant Slaughter doesn't have any tattoos. No, but you, no. But you have a, a ton. So uh, obviously they, was that, uh, so you, you had the long sleeves. Was that partially because of the tattoos? Yeah, what had happened was in season one, obviously, in that first scene that I do, I'm wearing the camouflage T-shirt. Right. So they airbrushed all of my arms. Oh, airbrushed, and okay. Part of my chest, which would be seen with the T-shirt. So I was completely airbrushed. So they covered me up so you couldn't see I had tattoos as well. It took them two and a half, maybe three hours to do it, but they did a sensational job. You would not have had a clue that I had tattoos. Right. But then their worry was once I got in the ring and I started to move around and wrestle, that the makeup would possibly come off. So originally they had skin color sort of tights to go from my wrist up to halfway up my bicep, and then they had the camouflage the rest of the way. But when we put it on, it just looked silly. So <laughs> they've gone with the full length to the wrists. Um, and then all they really had to do was cover my hand and then cover the tattoos on my neck and a bit around here because all the rest of it was completely covered. But I mean, I was, I think I was the most covered wrestler in the entire show. You know, I had this one piece camouflage gear from wrist. I had the black tights, which all the way down with the boots, you know, I looked like scuba Steve pretty much if you didn't know I was Sergeant Slaughter. So and it was so hot 
Right. It's, not like it's, it's not like it's just regular arena lights. Like it's television studio lights. Yep. Just oh my gosh! And of course you're, of course you would be sweating the makeup off. Yeah, but the the makeup ladies had these little industrial fans that when they come up to touch us up, they go here, hold this. So you're holding this fan in front of your face while they're doing all the touch ups and so on <laughs> to try and cook it up. Being in Queensland too, it was super hot and super humid. It's like Florida, so. Right. Oh, so, so you, where did you, so where did you film? It was in Queensland. So the top right hand side of Australia, which is a really sunny, really warm part of the country. Like I said, very much, very much like Miami, like Florida. It's uh, oh. humid, hot, sunny most of the time, but uh, the humidity is really what gets you up there. So that's interesting. I didn't realize that, that that's where they filmed it. Hmm. That's yeah. So you didn't have to, you didn't have to come over here to, 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 to work. No, look, oh, well, I would love it if, if we did. And uh, the rumor we've heard is that if season three comes off uh, and if Sergeant Slaughter is to get a green light to come in again, we've heard that there's the possibility that it will be filmed in Los Angeles. So we're, oh. we're keeping our fingers crossed. Have you, um, obviously you, ha have you done much, any wrestling over here or, or any, mm. any, you know, I, I know you've done movies and stuff, but uh, you, you, you have wrestled over here stateside. Yeah, Indianapolis, Indiana, Chicago. I was over there for uh, quite a while back in ooh, early 2000s, I think it was. I think I spent about a month and a half over there. Oh, nice. Mm. That's awesome. Now, I, I, one, one last thing about the, the tattoos. Uh, one, what was your first one? And two, I don't have any, but I heard once you get one, it's like a drug and you can't stop. Yep, that's exactly right. Look, I waited till I was 38 before I got my first tattoo <laughs> for the simple fact that my mum didn't like them and I was scared of mum, so I promised her that I would not get any tattoos. Then I'd already had my first son and I really wanted to get my first son's name on, on the, the inside of my forearm. So <laughs> the best way I could sell it to my mum was, it's Ashton's name. It's your grandson that's going to be on my forearm. You can't argue with that. And she's like, oh, okay. So, but what I didn't tell her was that I had Ashton's name on the inside of my arm. I had all these flames going up the backside of my forearm. I had a skull put on the outside of the forearm. I had all this other stuff added to it instead of just my, my beautiful son's name. And when I've come home and showed her, she's gone, what have you done? And I'm like, uh, I got Ash's name on my forearm. But you, you're absolutely right. Once you start to get tattoos, it is infectious. Like, I mean, look, they hurt. I'm not going to be a tough guy and say they don't hurt. They do hurt. They hurt heaps. But once it starts, the noise of the tattoo gun, the smell of the ink and the uh, the like the anesthetic stuff, that they not anesthetic, the stuff they clean with, um, it all just gets you and you're sitting there and then you see the end result or something like that and you go, wow, that's really cool. So I had all of my tattoos done in eight months. Oh. Yeah. So I Do didn't waste have... any time. <laughs> no, not at all. Do you have a, a number or, or do they kind of all blend into one at this point? Um, well, both my arms are sleeved all the way up to my shoulders. So they're all covered and I've got my left hands done. Uh, my chest is completely capped. So the, the shape of your chest and then that's all covered. I've got my wife's name on one side. I've got a, a skull on the other and then they blend up into my neck. Then across the top of my chest up here, I have maniac written there. So that was to, to for the character really more than anything else. Right. Um, then I had my maniac logo and a whole lot of stuff put on my back as well. So that all joined in as well. And then I went down and I had something done on my leg. So yeah, kind, kind of for the upper body, it all sort of mixes in together. Uh, knowing the physical toll that professional wrestling takes on you, and the, not not just you know physical but the mental toll uh you you have two young boys if they wanted to get involved in the wrestling business would you let them <laughs> yeah <laughs> been asked this one quite a bit my uh, my eldest son is very much a country boy 
Uh, he likes to go out in the middle of nowhere and fish and hunt and do all that sort of stuff. So I'm pretty certain he's almost 19 that he'll steer clear of that. He's not, he doesn't like to be the center of attention, you know, have all eyes on him and all that. He's, he's a quiet one, but Hunter, our, uh, our youngest, he's the show off. He does impressions, voices, accents, impersonations. He just likes to ham it right up. So, and plus two, he likes to beat the crap out of me when he can. So, um, <laughs> It could be it could be his path. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, now I want to talk about um, you know doing doing private for security for celebrities. Um, you know, like you said, you were you were bouncing. You were you know working security at, at clubs and, and stuff like that. So how do you transition from that to doing personal detail for for celebrities? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. I, I actually had gotten my security license, but I had a day job where I was working in a video arcade in a shopping center. So, you know, the ones when you used to go in and you'd, you'd play Street Fighter, you'd play Mortal Kombat, Double Dragon, all the cool games. Right. Um, I was working there during the day, just handing out change, fixing the machines if there was something wrong. And one of the security guards in the mall where I was working come up to me and he goes, We've got somebody coming in tomorrow for an event. Uh, can you help us get them in and out? Because we're a bit short-staffed. And they knew I'd trained and I was a big boy and could handle myself. So I said, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll give you a hand. So the next day, I'm down in the loading dock with them waiting. And this limousine pulls up. And we open the door. And this lady hops out with a hat and glasses on. And I kind of look at her like, I don't know who you are. Next week, she takes the hat and the glasses off. And it's Elle McPherson, the Australian model, the supermodel. So we have to escort her into the mall, upstairs to the event, and then we get her back out again, and everything ran smooth. There was no problems. Um, so she was the first person that I ever protected. And then from there, it kind of, your name gets out there, or people say, oh, who was that guy that they used? And right. it started from there. So, I mean, it's I've done that for, for 30 years now, and I've looked after all sorts like John Travolta, Van Damme, Steven Seagal, David Beckham, the Queen's granddaughter, all the bands, ACDC, all that sort of right. stuff. So it's been fun. Do you have a preference on, now you, you mentioned bands. Do you have a preference on, um, you know, doing band, you know, working, you know, for bands or, or working for movie stars or athletes? Uh, bands are hard, <laughs> as you can imagine. There's, right, because it's, uh, it's more than one person. So more than one person. Uh, they're not always sober is the best way to put it. <laughs> so they can be a bit of a handful. But then you move on to the movie stars, and especially big names like John Travolta. They're really professional. They're really lovely to work for. You know, they are professional actors. They know that they have to go see their fans. They have to sign autographs for them because they're the people that make them famous. Right. Um, athletes. I've done the WWE, I've protected all the WWE guys for 25 years. Um, and again, they're, they're quite famous, but they're also athletes too. So they need to go to the gym. They need to eat properly. They need to get enough sleep. So they're professionals in what they do as well. They're not just party animals that want to go out and do all this sort of stuff. But I have had a few that are party animals as well, not wrestlers, but people right. from bands. So um, I think I'd, I'd stick to the, the wrestlers and the movie stars over the, the people in bands 100%. Uh, all right. So without naming names, is there a story you can tell, like a, a funny story that, you know, ended up kind of weird? Uh, again, no, not naming names if you don't want to. Yeah. Look, I took a group out once after their show. I'm not going to say who or what they are, but they went out to a nightclub. Uh, and they enjoyed themselves quite a bit. And by the time we got back, it was that early in the morning that catering was opening up in the hotel for these people that had their own catering section. So I brought them in and they wanted to go straight to catering. All right. So we've gone into catering. They grabbed their food. But, of course, they've been out all night. They've been partying. They've been drinking. They're all wound up still. And I said to them, I said, I'm going to the bathroom, stay here, and then I'll get you back to your hotel room if you want to go there away from catering. I said, you know, I just go in the bathroom and I've come back. When I've come back, one's swinging from the chandelier, the other one's playing frisbees with the plates, and I've gone, oh, my God. 
It was crazy. I left them alone for five minutes. That well, I guess that was a valuable lesson to not to not leave anybody alone for five minutes at that point. <sighs> um, so uh, you you mentioned you know uh, bodybuilding. So you you what advice would you give? Because there are you know I, I know some people that are getting that want to get into bodybuilding. Um, you know, and have done competitions. So as far as, as bodybuilding goes, what advice would you give to somebody who, you know, that thinks it's just lifting weights and, and going and going to town? Ah, oh, look, it's, to me, I started it because I was bullied in school. So I wanted to make myself appear that, you know, you don't mess with me anymore. Um, Plus, I wanted to look like the ultimate warrior and Hulk Hogan as well. So, you know, it's a win-win. Uh, but for me, it was it was about discipline and training, you know, to learn how to train the right way, the discipline of having to push and do three or four more reps when you feel like you can't do it. But the feeling you get after you've done it, you're like, oh, I've really achieved something. Plus, you get a good pump in your muscles. The blood's in there. You feel big. You feel better. Um, and starting at 16 for me was a, a big thing because – some of my friends took the road of at 16 wanting to be able to go out party and drink all night and do all this other stuff other friends of mine went the route of cars and messing around with them and doing this and that uh but me it was all about the gym so you know when i woke up in the morning you'd have breakfast first thing i do at 10 o'clock is i go straight to the gym i'd have to do that every day and with the work i was doing as well it was very relevant to be big strong and fit as well um, so I think it's a great idea. My, we've got quite a decent gym here in the house and my, uh, my youngest son likes to every now and then come down and not so much have a play. He'll train, but you know, he's only 11, so he can't take it too seriously. My eldest who's almost 19. He's, he's about six, four. He's taller than me. Oh, wow. He's 83 kilos at the moment. He loves training. He's a machine. Yeah, so that's, a, that's a, he's a, that's a big dude. That's uh, he's going to be a, a big dude following your footsteps. All right. So before we get into, um, uh, before we go, I, I, I want to get into uh, one of our, our uh, mini games here and it is called the Milo Beasley show frequently asked questions. I'm going to ask you the same five questions that I asked to all my guests here on the show. There's no wrong answers. First thing that pops into your head. Uh, all right. Question number one, okay. what was the first concert? that you attended? First concert, uh, Phil Collins. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah. 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 I was a big fan of him because, you know, he wasn't over the top. He'd come out in a suit and he'd just stand there and sing. So him and Robert Palmer were my two favorites when I was growing up. Oh, that, that, that that's, that's two good ones. Uh, so what, what year would, would this, this would have been post Genesis then, right? Sorry, what was that? Uh, what do you remember about what year this was uh, that you saw him? Oh wow, uh, early nineties, maybe I'd say. So that's he was time. still in his prime when he, when he was singing. Yeah, yeah, that's oh man, early oh early ninety. That would have been a great. Uh, question number two: Do you believe in ghosts? Yep. Have you had any weird experiences? I have. <laughs> I used to work <clears throat> when I was a kid at a an amusement place called Magic Mountain. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's on the beach, right on the front of the beach there. And it's a big, big uh, sort of uh, mountain shape. And it's got water slides in it and everything there. And, and to make it short really quick, they have a restaurant in there. I used to work late into the night to close up the place. And I've gone into the kitchen and I've gone out the back where the rubbish compactor is right near the beach and so on like this. And as I've opened the door, it's all black, but I've gone there to check on the back gate. And as I've gone there, I've opened the gate, but then I felt something freezing cold come over me and I've turned around and I swear to God, there was a little boy in a little blue outfit from like the 1850s standing next to the freezer staring at me. And it scared the hell out of me. I come running out of the kitchen I ran up into the manager's office and I'm shaking. And you know what he said to me? He looked at me and he went, you've seen him. 
And I've gone, oh, my God. So he had seen him as well. Other staff had seen him. I was petrified to go in there at nighttime after that. Ah, uh, the fact that he knew what you were going to say. Yep. Ah. Uh. Yeah, that scared me more, I think. <laughs> <laughs> ah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. All right, so uh, this one's one of my one of my favorite questions. It's a little twist on a, a common question, but in a movie about your life, who would play your parents? The parents from the Jetsons. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, simply that might because be the best answer I've had. <laughs> the dad looks like my dad. Yeah, and the mother was so beautiful and caring for Elroy and everyone. That was exactly what my mom was like. That's what a great answer. I don't know if I could <laughs> ask this. I don't know if I could ask this question again because I won't get a better answer than that. <laughs> uh, question number four. Who is your favorite person to follow on social media? A Cocker Spaniel page. Because I love Cocker Spaniel dogs. I don't think I've seen this. I need to go. Yeah, uh, there's, there's quite a few. There's it's not really a specific one, um, but I follow a lot of, lot of dogs and all that sort of stuff. I have wrestlers and people that I've worked with and my family and all that sort of stuff. But my main thing is that. And, yeah, the, the, I really like the, <laughs> the Cocker Spaniel pages. Uh, and then our, our last question here. Um, it, it's actually quite an interesting question considering your involvement with wrestling and the, the movie industry and the bodyguard industry. But have you had a fanboy moment where you met somebody, either a wrestler or a celebrity, and you were just dumbstruck? You couldn't talk. Um, you were... You didn't know how to react when you when you met them. Luckily, no, because I think if I did, I wouldn't be able to do the work I'm doing. Right. <laughs> I mean, from you know, I've been a massive friend, a fan of John Travolta. I've been a huge fan of Van Damme, Steven Seagal, all of those guys. Then, then to do the WWE people, being a wrestler, uh, it was huge for me. So I, I really prided myself on conducting myself the right way. You know. Absolutely. When I'm with them and I'm sitting in the front of the car, I'm I'm at the front watching for stuff. I'm not chatting to them in the back. They can have their conversation. The only time I will respond is if they ask me a question. Same when we're out somewhere, I'm standing, you know, two inches behind them on their right or in front of them like that. I don't talk to them unless they talk to me. But funny enough, when you act that way, they do gravitate to you more and then they oh. will talk to you more. Because they like that, because they know you're not going to be the fanboy. I want to ask a million questions about what they do, and you know, you remember in Face, I loved you in Face Off when you, you know, they don't, they don't get any of that. So I keep it really professional that I don't say anything unless they they speak back to me. Um, I don't ask for a photo. I don't ask for an autograph. But the funny thing is, is when the media is around while I'm working, I know exactly where to stand to get right in the middle of that photo that's going to be in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> now that's called being a professional yeah uh Absolutely. before we go i'd be remiss if i didn't ask about uh pirates of the caribbean uh and and working on on dead man tell no tales how did how was that experience that was insane i mean i i was i was only an extra in it but I was an extra in a real main part of it. And what had happened was, again, it was filmed in Queensland, up, up the top of Australia, and they were after a, a whole heap of people to play pirates. So I got the nod to go in and they saw me and they said, yep, great, so you're in makeup. I've got big lab chop sort of things here and the beard and dirt all over me and everything. And I didn't know what the scene was. So then we've gone to where the set is and there are all these massive shipping containers in big sort of U-shapes, and they're like four or five containers high, so they're huge. Then when you come around, there's all blue screen draped on the inside, and in the middle are these full-size pirate ships, completely to scale, built them up and everything, and they're elevated off the ground as well. So what <coughs> what had happened was <coughs> we were brought in, we were scissor lift up onto the top of the boat, and we hopped in the boat, and then from there we were told that, 
<laughs> we were the unfortunate ship that uh, gets destroyed when the kraken comes up from the bottom of the ocean and wraps its tentacles around us and then just drags us straight down under us. So we had to pretend that it was a nice day on the boat doing, we were my section, and you can actually see me in shop um, playing cards on one of the wine barrels. And then we have to react that, you know, the kraken has just grabbed us and, oh, my God, we're, we're dying. Here we go. We're dead. So, but it was, it was fun. It was good. That's uh, that's awesome, and that's a, what an iconic scene too. Yeah, well, I, mean, that's I, when... I, I literally just I turned it on the other day because it, it was on TV, and it was that scene. <laughs> so yeah, again, what an iconic scene, and and I don't know if uh, you know how the news and social media is out in, in Australia, but have you been? I don't, you know, you will have to get into details, but have you been up to date on the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial? Look, I've, I've seen bits and pieces of it, and I read a pretty big article the other day on social media on what's relating to it, and it's it's a shame because the only thing I see happening here is two careers being destroyed in the public. That's what I see. There's going to be no winner whatsoever. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, agreed. Agreed. Yeah. And I think that's the, the most professional answer that, that you can give, you know, considering your you know, your, your stance. Uh, so uh, again, thank you so much for, for chatting with me. Uh, Young Rock, the season finale, series two season finale, Tuesday, May 17th. Uh, hopefully there will be a season three and hopefully we will get some more Sergeant Slaughter out of that. Um, uh, that would be fantastic. And and maybe we get you over stateside and, and you can, you know, face to face with Sergeant Slaughter as well. Well, look, it's it's the plan. Anthony, my manager, uh, who you've spoken to, he's planning on getting me over there, possibly September, um, depending on if we do come over to shoot Young Rock. If not, we'll come over in September. We've got to do some networking and some things with a few people and so on. We'd love to, love to see you when we come over. I know when I spoke to Sarge the other week, he said him and his daughter Kelly would definitely come to uh, wherever I was in LA to catch up as well. So it'll be, it'll be good fun. That, that's fantastic. So before we go, uh, your social medias, where can folks find you? Where are you most active? Yeah, the main one is my Instagram. So it's Wayne underscore Matty, spelt the same way on the screen. Uh, my Facebook page is the Maniac, Wayne Matty. Uh, they're my two main ones that I use more than anything else. I don't do Twitter. I don't understand it. I don't see a reason for it. So uh, <laughs> I stick to those two. Look, I'm, I'm almost 50, so I need to keep it simple, you know. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely again thank you so much for for hanging out with me and thank you everybody who's watching if you haven't already yet please hit that subscribe button and most importantly tell your friends and don't forget young rock uh, season finale may 17th uh, wait if you hang out after the outro we'll say a proper goodbye everybody else we'll see you next week thanks very much